Well, it's great to be with you again, and looking forward uh, to uh, time with you to, to look through Zephaniah. We're going to be looking at Zephaniah 3, which was um, read during the uh, Advent c- uh, candle reading. So we're just kind of looking forward to that and uh, time to be together. So I hope you're doing well. Again, if this is your first time, especially for those who will be watching this later on TV, we're so glad that you're watching with us or with us this morning. Um, Just make sure that if this is your first time, make sure you stop by the Welcome Center and make sure uh, you get kind of a, there's kind of a a welcome bag for you with all kinds of things in there to help, you know, to let you know about the church, what we're doing, uh, some things uh, to take home, and uh, great to have uh, you you take one of those. Also, if you um, there's notice there's a connection car right in the big front of your pew. You can always fill those out um, to let let us know about you know um, your, your contact information so we can pray for you. We can send Christmas cards to you. Um, we have a lot of needs in our church always um, for ministries. And on the back, you'll notice the things that if God is speaking to you, if you feel called to do something, if you're passionate about a ministry, even if you think that it's well stocked and doing well and everything's going fine, we can always use more people in every ministry. So if you're looking forward to, to doing something um, that are named there or if you have something different in mind, please let us know. There's also a place there for a prayer request as well. So that's a great way to, to connect. Um, uh, be, before we begin the sermon this morning, I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we had a power outage here on Thursday morning. Um, they didn't get the power back on until almost noon. And so the women's Bible study was, um, was canceled because of that. Um, but they're going to have their final meeting this coming Thursday at 1030 in the JMH. If this is your first time, the JMH is right across the parking lot. You'll see the sign there. It says JMH, and that's where they'll be having the um, of the meeting, so looking forward to that. Um, also, encourage you again to look at the the back of your bulletins. All kinds of things coming up. You know, two big events coming up next week that Greg pointed out that are important, as well as the Christmas Eve service is at 5 p.m. I'm looking forward um, to that. So. Um, Today we're going to be kind of continuing our our, our journey through um, Advent and looking through um, Christmas. And uh, the purpose of this sermon series that we've been talking about is the story of Advent leading up to the coming of Jesus. So this anticipation of Jesus coming and being prepared for that time. And so today we're going to be focusing on the theme of joy. The last couple of weeks we looked at um, hope and we looked at peace, and now we're going to be looking at um, joy. So we're going to be looking at Zephaniah 3, um, 14 through 20. Zephaniah is one of those little prophets, minor prophets, and kind of stuck in the middle of the Bible that sometimes gets lost, or you, sometimes you might need a, the table of contents to find them. Um, if you ha- are using a pew Bible, it's on page 837, so a quick way to get there um, if you're using using your cell phone or you have brought your Bible, then you can uh, read along as well. I will have um, the um, reading on the overhead as well, so you can read that. Here's what Zephaniah says in chapter 3, verse 14. Sing for joy, daughter of Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy The king of Israel, the Lord, is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, do do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute for you, an approach on her. Yes, at that time I will deal with all of you who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time I will bring you back. Yes, at that time I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, the Lord have spoken. Let us pray. Father, we are just so thankful that we can be with you this morning and that we can have joy and joy in the midst of so many different circumstances. We have so many uh, prayer requests and so many things that we can think about this week, and I have come to mind um, through the last couple of days, I want to pray, especially um, for the entire Green family, um, for Tom Sr., who's in the hospital, Middlesex Hospital right now, suffering some 
COVID um, complications. I pray for Tom Green Jr., who is just kind of just getting over COVID, and I pray, God, for Nancy, that you will um, surround her with your protection right now and guide her and just help her to continue to get those negative test results back. We look forward to what you have in store for them. Just be with Tom right now in the hospital. Give wisdom to the doctors as they're looking over um, him and help them um, to feel better. You are the master physician, and you can heal him during this difficult time. I pray, God, that you will help to speak through me as, um, this morning, that everything that comes out of my mouth will be pleasing to you, be coming from you. I pray, God, that your spirit will be upon us now to help us to understand this text in a deeper way and help it to apply to our very lives. In your name we pray. Amen. So um, today we're going to be kind of continuing you know, the season of Advent, and so we've talked about um, the focus this morning is going to be on joy, and joy is talking about a sense of contentment, and we'll look about kind of defining that word in a little bit more in depth, but it's the sense of contentment and peace that we have in the midst of any circumstance. And so there's a feeling of joy that comes over you because you are content in your relationship, and so no, no matter what happens in your life, you can be content, you can have joy. And so we'll be looking about what that means and why it is so important. And so we looked at Advent and uh, kind of some review, if, if, if you haven't been here or if you're kind of uh, lost on what the Advent candle is all about. But it's, um, um, Greg spoke of this this morning. It's about this anticipation of Christ's birth in the season leading up to Christmas. And so the Advent candle came to represent a time of the light of Christ into a dark world. Sometimes it's neat to, you know, to drive around town and you'll see candles in the window that light up the street. And it's really kind of gives you a sense of um, God's peace and joy and, and love. And, and so that's what it came to represent, a light, a, a shining in the darkness. And so the first two weeks that we looked at um, the few themes of hope and peace, and they both focus on Jesus' second coming. Advent's all about the word coming. It's coming. It's on the horizon. And so this week we're going to be looking at joy, and next week we'll be looking at love, and they both focus on Christ's first coming. So Jesus came, you know, he was incarnate, incarnate uh, walked with us in the flesh, and then he has promised his people that he would return one day. And so that is what Advent is all about. And this morning we lit the Advent candle of joy about rejoicing in the Lord. And the third Sunday of Advent is also called the Gaudet Sunday, which is Latin for rejoice. If you grew up Catholic and if you went to a Catholic Latin mass, you may have heard the word Gaudet used in the service. That's what it means. It's rejoicing. We mark the difference of this Sunday by lighting the pink candle on the Advent wreath. Because we have now transitioned from the second coming focus to the first coming focus. And that is what really is the, the kind of the heart of what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And so last week we looked at peace and kind of reviewing that a little bit. We have this idea of biblical peace is more than just stress-free life. In the world today, we really want this world to just be stress-free. We don't want to have any problems. And we wonder, why is my life not stress-free all the time? And it seems like we are, we are always trying to figure out a way to make our life stress-free. That's what we do in life. We, we think about, how can I make my life stress-free from work, from um, what's going on in life, um, with my friends, with my family, with uh, all, uh, workplace, all kinds of different things. How can I get my life to be stress-free? But peace is a lot more than just that. It's about shalom, which the Jews still use as a, as a greeting, shalom. It means so much more than just, I hope you have an easygoing life today. I hope there's no noise in your life. It's about being um, whole, about health, about integrity, about total well-being. I pray that your whole life will be one of peace with God that's what shalom is all about. Peace is about the fact that God has restored what was broken. Talk a little bit about what happened and why we need to be followers of Christ, about the situation that we came into this world in, and sin, and darkness, and death. And he brought us life, life that will never end. And so what he also did was he established an everlasting covenant of rest and peace with his people. And so today, we've, the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at different prophets. And we looked at Jeremiah, we looked at Isaiah, and now we're going to be looking at Zephaniah and his uh, passage that here, a wonderful book. Um, spend time this week, look, um, go back and read Zephaniah. It's three short chapters 
It won't take you very long, but it's an amazing story, amazing things that Zephaniah talks about. And he prophesied during the reign and the reforms of King Josiah. If you remember, Josiah was um, pretty much the last king of Judah and uh, reigned from 640 to 609 BC, right before the uh, Babylonians came in to destroy the empire. And the great northern kingdom had already fallen by the Assyrians. And so now, during the time of Zephaniah, you just have the southern kingdom in Judah, which is right around the Jerusalem territory. And so this is what's going on. And so Josiah was a good king. He was one of the few good kings of Israel. And he wanted to have a revival take place in Judah. He was a man of God. He wanted all Israel to do what? To remove all the idols that over the centuries the people of pagan gods have been putting back into the temple. And so he wanted to restore the temple as a place of holiness, a place that people would come to worship God alone. The problem was is that Israel was far too gone in their sin to let that take effect. They were wrapped way too much into idolatry. And we have so much idolatry in our own world that it can kind of cover over our eyes and blind us to the truth. An idol is anything that you place first in your life other than God. Anything. Whatever that is, whatever your first priority in life is, if it's not Jesus, then you are worshiping an idol. And so this is what happened here, is that the Babylonian Empire was on the scene, it was on the way, it was about to destroy the Judean people, and so Zephaniah pleads with the people one more time, that if they don't change their ways, then judgment is coming. It's on the horizon, it's, it's, it's there. However, he also promises them restoration, joy, and deliverance are coming for those who repent, who put away their idols, who trust in the Lord God, who follow his word, who restore the, uh, the temple, who obey God's word. Those will become what? Joy, deliverance. And so this is what Je- Zephaniah is doing. And one of the things that I think is amazing is if you read through the book of Zephaniah, it just pours out joy. The passage we read to this morning is all about joy, about joy in the Lord. And so the question is, what do we mean by joy? See, joy is different than happiness. Happiness can happen spontaneously. And we can have a birthday party and be happy and excited. And then all of a sudden on the way home we hear bad news and our happiness goes from happiness to sad. And we can have a time in our life where things seem to be so happy, and then the next minute things don't seem to be so going well. But see, joy is different. Joy is this passion for God. Joy is this deepening that happens over time with us, this idea that it resides deep within our soul, that nothing can move it. So that when things come in your life, your response is one of, I can do this. I can handle this through the Lord. Think of Paul. I think Paul is one of the most perfect examples of joy anywhere in the Bible. Why? Because he was under house arrest in Rome, tied to a Roman guard. Maybe got one meal a day, if that. And yet, if you look at his letter to the Philippians, he uses the word joy 16 times. Rejoice in the Lord. He knew what it was like because he knew his Lord and Savior, and so no matter where he was in life, he had joy. See, joy sustains us when the world around us will test us on different things. You know, we may say, boy, I got over that one thing, and I think now everything in life is going to be better. And then what happens? Something else hits us. Something else comes up. You know, we fix one problem, and it's kind of like, you know, life sometimes can be, you know, you know that, that cartoon of, like, you know, the, the water and the pipe breaks, and, the, and, the, and the, you know, the, and Mickey's trying to hold it back, and then the next one breaks, and he's like this, and he's putting his feet up trying to get all the different holes plugged up, and the next thing you know, it just rushes right into his face, and sometimes life can be like that. It can be difficult. And so it can, um, joy is one of those things that can help us to sustain us. It's not just about happy emotions. Sometimes, oh, I've been so much feeling of so much joy. Yes, you might have a feeling of happiness, but joy is kind of this deep-seated contentment. 
everything is going to be okay because the Lord is with me. About two years ago, I experienced this. My wife and I experienced this. She had surgery, and we, about eight, ten days later, we had a follow-up with the doctor. And so we had some scan, you know, we had to go, and, and he uh, evaluated uh, Jennifer. He said, well, it looks like your surgery went really well. I think you're going to be okay. Just follow these simple things. I remember driving home, and my wife and I were so excited. We were joyful. We were happy. We stopped and got something to eat on the way home, and things looked great. Twelve hours later, we were in the emergency room with life threatening complications. Our happiness had turned to sadness and doom. I remember in the car thinking, I need to get my wife to the hospital as soon as possible before she bleeds out at home, and that turns to what? Your happiness goes to darkness pretty quick. But there's a sense of, it's going to be okay. I felt this thing in in the pit of my stomach like, God's with you in this. It's going to be all right. I don't know why that feeling came over me, but it did. I remember saying to Jennifer after, I just felt like if I could just get you to the hospital, things would be okay. I remember her surgeon coming into the room and saying, you know what, Michael, I'm so glad you got her here because she only had a few hours left or otherwise she would have passed away. But things are going to be, he looked at me straight in the eye, he said, things are going to be okay now. It's going to be all right. I knew that was confirmation that the Lord would be taking care of my wife. And through the next two months of time in the hospital, the God just kept pouring out his love. And we experienced that through you as well. The cards, the phone calls, the time of thanksgiving, all those things brought us a confirmation of joy that things would be okay. Because happiness comes and goes, but joy stays there because it's content in something else. It's built on a foundation of Christ. So biblical joy is that sense of contentment and peace we feel in the midst of circumstances. And so we're going to look a bit, little bit more closely on this text here in Zephaniah 3 and look about this theme of joy and looking through these different passages. In Zephaniah, if you go back and read this story, it basically is broken up into three different theme type sections. So the first chapter, um, and, and then kind of a little bit into the second chapter, Zephaniah kind of warns the people of Judah that judgment's coming. It's a very dark, gloomy kind of a picture. Judgment is promised to them that they're going to, if they keep rebelling against the Lord, Zephaniah does say there that hope, though, is there for the faithful remnant. So he gives you this glimmer of hope of joy. And then right in the middle of the section, the beginning of chapter 2 through the kind of the first eight verses of chapter 3, Zephaniah warns Judah's enemies in Jerusalem again that judgment is coming. Things are so bad for the nations in Jerusalem that God's judgment is quickly approaching. And then there's this beautiful section from verse 9 through the rest of the book where Zephaniah brings this picture of hope and joy in the midst of their dark situation. He speaks of hope, joy, renewal, restoration for the nations, that the Lord's judgment that was talked about over the last two, pass- uh, last two chapters, that in the midst of God's judgment, there is time of purification for the nations. God is saying here, I'm going to discipline you like a father who loves his child. I'm not going to give up on you. God wants to transform his people into one unified family, and the Lord wants to protect and rescue his people from evil. So you go from this dark period of time that Zephaniah is talking about to this time of hope. So Zephaniah forces us to hold two biblical themes about God's character together, his justice and his love. Is there another thing that happens in world history that focuses on God's justice and love? Look to the cross. That is a time of pure justice and love. Bringing people back, making things right again because God loves his people. Look at verse 14. Sing for joy, daughter Zion, Shout loudly, Israel, be glad and celebrate with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. See, Zephaniah summons us to rejoice with all our heart. So in what the Lord has done for us, we can think back and say we can rejoice in God because of the things that he's brought us through. That he loves us in spite of the things that we are doing. That he sent his only one son 
to die for us, to rise from the dead to give us new life. So we can rejoice in the midst of our troubles because the Lord's grace, mercy, and love for his people. He loves us. He went out and and seeked us out. So look at verse 15. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is among you. You need no longer feel harm. What happens here is there was punishment happening for sin. They were a rebellious nation. They were putting idols in the temple, and God used the Babylonians to judge the Israelites. And then he put them in exile for 70 years, but he didn't evaporate them from the earth. He took care of them in the exile. And then later, 70 years later, he brought them back. And so we can think here and um, focus on the fact that God loves his children unconditionally. He just loves us. Why? Because he's a God of love. It is who he is. He loves us not because we're smart, not because we're handsome or beautiful or talented or lovable or make a lot of money or have a great resume or whatever it is. He loves us because of who he is. In fact, he loves us in spite of who we are because we always do things where we fail him. None of us are perfect. None of us have purely trusted in the Lord at all times. We've all made mistakes. But see, God loves us in spite of who we are. God loves us ultimately because he is a God of love. And his very essence is all about love. It just comes from him. I've said this several times, but again, if you are questioning, does God love me? Does God care about me? Does God, is, is he going to be okay with the things that I've done in life? Is, is something going to help me through this problem? Look to the cross. It's the greatest expression of love that's ever happened in world history. The God of all creation became what? Human and died for his people. An innocent person who was perfect, who never sinned, What? Willfully gave up his life for you. That is the greatest expression of love of all time. So we may not, he may not like the choices we make in life or the things that we're doing, but he never stops loving us. See, the Lord wants all people to be saved. And some of of us may be questioning whether God loves you. Boy, if God only knew the thing that I did in the past... I can't forgive myself, or my parents can't forgive me of the thing I did, or my friend can't forgive me, or my spouse can't forgive me. Guess what? God has forgiven you because he died on the cross and took that punishment for you. So maybe you did something in the past that you feel ashamed of. Maybe you've been carrying this guilt around with you for decades. How can God love me in spite of what I've done? Look to Israel. Israel disobeyed God again and again and again. Over centuries, they disobeyed him, and yet God always took care of Israel. He will take care of you now. You might be thinking, how can God love me in spite of this? Well, let me just say this. As your pastor, I want you to know that today you can put away your guilt and know that God loves you. You have my permission to forgive yourself. Whatever you've done, why? Because Jesus already took that punishment upon himself on the cross. So you don't need to carry around that dead horse anymore. Put it to bed. It's over. It's been dealt with. There's things in my life that I'm ashamed of, but Jesus, what? Died for those things. And he also died for the person who wronged you, who hurt you. Why? He sent his only son. He died and he was raised to give us new life. That is the ultimate example of love. And he willingly did this. No one forced him to do it. As Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. Not when you got your act together, then I died for you. No, in the midst of our sin, God took action. Christ died for us. 
See, we can rejoice because the Lord has and will deliver us from our enemies. And your enemy is not a person. It's the spiritual forces of darkness. We talked about this in Ephesians. That is where our real battle lies. See, Satan uses people to get at us, to make our our, our problems worse. So the fights that we have in life, the source of that is not the person you have an argument with. It's Satan himself working through that person. Don't allow Satan to get a grip hold in your life and give you guilt for what you did. It's already been dealt with. Jesus nailed it to the cross. So through his life, ministry, death, and resurrection, Jesus defeated the powers of sin, death, and the devil. And your guilt. And he brought us complete forgiveness of your sin for all time. For all time. For past, present, and any future thing that you do, it's already been dealt with on the cross. That should give you a sense of freedom and joy because you know that the Lord of the universe cares for you, loves you unconditionally, suffered a horrific death for you, So we've been delivered from the bondage of darkness, and Jesus is our king. He's our Lord, and he dwells with his people, and he takes care of them. Why? Because he's a good king. This is the important thing here, that Jesus loves us unconditionally. Why? Because he suffered and died for us, even in the midst of our Sin. Look at verse 16. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. What's going on here is that he's saying, Listen, the promise of joy does not mean that God's people can just sit around and wait for the Lord to come. Like, hey, thank you for saving me. I'm just going to you know, sit by the pool and wait for your second coming. No, we've been commissioned by our Lord to do something, to work out the ministry that he's called us to do. We've been saved from our sin, but we've also been saved for a purpose. Otherwise, he would have just taken us right into the new heavens and new earth. There's no other purpose for us other than just get saved on earth. No, he saved you for a purpose. To be commissioned to what? A ministry that he's given you through the gifts that he's given you, the talents he's given you. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The author of Hebrews makes a very similar point in Hebrews 12. Great chapter, go read it. Verses 12 through 13, he says, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed itself. Meaning what? That we've been called to go out and take care of people to spread his word, to care for the sick, the brokenhearted, for those who can't take care of themselves. So those of us who have trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have been admonished to what? To declare to others by word and deed that a new day is dawning in the world. A new lease of life has come. There's a new day dawning for those who are miserable and feel guilty and feel like they haven't amounted to anything in life. God has what? Saved you. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. The kingdom of God, his rule, his reign is now upon the world. And so we can say the kingdom of God is here. Repent in this good news. That is the message that God has called us to do in word and deed to share that love of Christ with others, but also help those who need help. See, we can rejoice because the Lord will help us conquer our fears. Now, whatever you're afraid of, God will conquer, will help you conquer that fear. Some of us are scared to death of spiders. Some of us are scared of snakes or, or whatever it is, but God will, whatever fear you have, And some of us fear that we're not going to be able to do it, or we're afraid of failure, or we're afraid of what? Commitment. The Lord will help you conquer your fears. You do not need to be afraid. 
Look at verses 17 18. The Lord your God is a mighty warrior who saves. I think we all know that song, he is mighty to save. Well, I think it's pretty much gotten from right here. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute for you and a reproach on her. Talking about here, the approach on her, on, on the, anyone who is coming after you. This is amazing. We have a warrior of God who saves us, and he does what? He rejoices over you. He is quiet in his love. He is delighting in the world of singing. He just cannot help but be with you. So we can rejoice because the Lord is mighty to save and he takes action doing so. He doesn't wait for us. He doesn't wait for us to get our act together. He comes to us. The love of God for his people is one of action. He doesn't wait for us to get our act together. He saves us in the midst of our life and situation. He saves us from sin, death, and the devil. He saves us for a purpose, to conform us to his image. We've been saved to be more like him so that we can be more effective in this world for him and his glory. And that's the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus saves us and then puts us to work. So we can rejoice because the Lord celebrates his relationship with us. The picture Zephaniah here is re- revealing one of a loving father shouting for joy because he loves his children. He's proud of them, even in the midst of their sin, because he's a God of love. And he's take care of your sin through the cross. Look at ver- verses of 19 and 20. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you, There may be people who are oppressing you, people who you feel that are just out to get you, that you want to take up arms and, you know, do something. You want to to take action. You're ready to do something to them. And what is happening here is that the Lord is saying, I will deal with that situation. It's not your job to take judgment or justice into your own hands. That is what the Lord is doing. See, what God calls us to is, to love our neighbor, and to love God. There's not a third one there, take justice into your own hands. If someone wrongs you, go after them. Retribution is for you. No, our job is even the people we don't like, we are supposed to love them. And and let God take care of judgment, of justice. That's his job. I will deal with all who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts. I will bring people to myself. I will make those who disgraced you throughout the earth, I will help you, what, receive peace in the midst of your situation. See, we can rejoice because the Lord can and will dry our tears and change our sadness to joy. See, we can rejoice also because the Lord is restoring us and gives us everlasting peace, which will be realized in the new heaven and new earth. He says, I want you to do a job now that I've saved you. I want you to do the things that I've called you to do, and one day you will be with me for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. That's a pretty amazing message. So we look to this passage as one of pure, ultimate love and joy. That's what Zephaniah is saying. In the midst of all this situation going on in Israel, God still loves you. God is still faithful to his people. Old Testament scholar Owen Palmer Robertson has called this passage that we've looked at in Zephaniah 13 through 20, sorry, 14 through 20, as one of the most moving descriptions of love of God for his people found anywhere in scripture. If you're looking for a passage that talks about that God loves you, this is the one to go to. If you're worried about that, if you're wondering whether God really deeply cares for you, just go through and read this passage. 
I mean, he's rejoicing over you. He's glad that you're part of, of his family. He delights in what? Singing a song for you. That's a beautiful poetic language for the fact that God cares for you deeply. So this week, as you go out in, in the world, think about the fact, how would my life look different if I know in the depth of my soul that God truly loves me and has saved me? How would that affect your relationships at home or in the workplace or in the community or how you live your life? How would that affect you? A couple questions also, you can look at kind of some practical things this week. These come right from the Advent devotional. If, if you haven't picked up one of those, um, there's several weeks left you can look at. But what's the best way for you to get ready for something big and important in your life? What changes do you need to make to, the, uh, from your normal routine to get ready for those things? Like we're preparing for Jesus' coming for Christmas. How can we prepare our hearts for that coming? I think one of the first things we can do is know that God loves you unconditionally. And second thing here is, what gives you the most joy when you think about Christ's birth? When you come on Christmas Eve service, are you there because you've just always gone to Christmas Eve service? Or do you go because you just can't wait to be with your Lord and Savior and to be with others who share in that belief? In what ways can you keep your joy fresh all week long in the midst of all kinds of things and circumstances going on in life? Focus on the fact that we can have joy in the midst of any situation. Let us pray. Father, we are just so blown away by what you've done for us, that you've brought us joy, that you've brought us new life that we can look to you for the things that we need in the midst of our darkness and separation, sometimes from the, what's going on and how we feel and the things that are going through our life. We can have joy and contentment and hope knowing that you love us and died for us. And if anyone here, God, is still struggling with, does God really love me? You just look to the cross. God loved you, died for you. And if you want to be part of that family, if you want to follow Jesus and, and be part of the family of God, all you need to do is tell him that, I'm sorry for the things that I've done, for the sins that I've committed in life, and I know through your cross that you love me unconditionally, and I just want to follow you the rest of my life, and I want my life to be different and to make a difference in this world because I'm part of you. If you prayed that prayer, if, if, if you feel that way, all you need to do is just write down on that connection card, I received Christ this morning, and someone will talk with you and be with you about the next step of the journey. We want to thank you, God, for your many praises and glory this morning. In your name you pray. Amen. One of the ways we can thank God and that we can